As a spinner, it's never easy to make your debut for Australia when Shane Warne is still playing. But Nathan Horitz managed to do it way back in 2002. At the same time, he waited for four years, waited for his comeback and had an inspirational cricketing career. Hello everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Expert Corner. This is your host Anush Prabhu and today I'm having former Australian off-spinner Nathan Horitz with me. Hi sir, how are you? I'm very well Anush, thank you mate, thank you for having me on. Thank you. So, uh, what are you doing these days? Oh, I uh, so I'm in Brisbane, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. These days, I coach. I coach full time. I run my own cricket academy here in Brisbane. Uh, I head coach at Norse Cricket Club as well. Uh, a little bit of work with the Queensland Fire, the, the girls team, and the Brisbane Heat girls team. Um, just in, incredibly busy helping the next generation of cricketers coming through. That's that's really a good thing, you know. Uh, talking about cricket as a sport, as you rightly mentioned, uh, cricketers come through at a very young age. At a young age, some people play just a sport, you know, like in India, we play, you know, in Australia also, you might be playing in the summers, in the back, like in Australia, it's uh, renownedly called backyard cricket. So everybody plays cricket, but, you know, there is some someone in our family who, family or as a coach, there is some personality who inspires us to take it as a sport. Was there any particular cricketer, a coach, or someone else who inspired you to take the game professionally? No, not really. Look, I think growing up, my grandfather played a little bit of cricket. My dad didn't really play. Uh, it was just a sport that I really loved playing as a young kid, always with my grandfather. And it just sort of grew from there. I, I had the opportunity when I was young to, to play against some older kids. And uh, I did okay. And, and then the, the journey sort of just started. And I think I really enjoyed, I, I was a batter growing up and, and I really enjoyed that aspect. And I was very fortunate to play as much as I did first class cricket and, and cricket for Australia. But I, I think probably the most influential person was probably my granddad and my dad growing up. Yeah. Yeah. So any particular innings that you remember with the bat or with the ball that, you know, you got that confidence that I can't only dream of it, but I can also play it at <laughs> successful at the highest level. As a kid or when I grew up as an adult? Yeah, growing up, whatever. Yeah. Uh, look, I got back-to-back -back hundreds for Queensland. Uh, sorry, for New South Wales. One was against Queensland. I was starting to hit form. It was just before I did my shoulder. I was batting really well then. Uh, I played a couple of good innings for Australia in one day arena. Um, got a, uh, As night watchman, got 70-odd for, for Australia in the test against Pakistan. Probably my best ever bowling, I felt, was was probably the second innings against Pakistan. I bowled really well, took five wickets there. I, I never really felt on top of my bowling game. I was always chasing my tail. I, I never felt fully in grasp of everything that I was trying to do. Um, you know, so, but my batting, I was pretty comfortable with. I would have loved to have played a lot more and uh, averaged more, but, you know, say la vie, that's such as life. Yes. Uh Making a test debut and getting a baggy green for Australia is always a you know, very special moment for every Australian. So, you know, uh, you played in that famous test at Mumbai uh, where, you know, Australia couldn't chase 107 and everybody, everybody in India kind of remembers it as one of India's famous victories against Australia. But to be really honest, Australia won that series 2-1 and that was that should have been the bigger picture. Because as Steve Waugh has always called it the final frontier and you you guys conquered it. So anything special memories that you remember from your debut or from that series? I remember the, the series just being absolutely incredible. I was obviously 12th man for the first three games. Then Shane Warne broke his thumb and I replaced him. How hard this series was. We were lucky to draw the third test Uh India, I think, needed something about 220 on the last day and Sewa had come out and whacked 20 and two overs and then it was washed out on the last day. And then, so moving into the final test, there's so much that I remember about that test, you know, bowling to Tendulkar, getting Kumble as my first wicket, getting out to Kumble twice, uh, trying to save the game with Jason Gillespie. Him and I, I think, put on about 30 uh, there, you know, to get us close. Just so many different things and... It was a bit of a blur. It was over so quickly, that test match. But being part of that series was simply incredible. So how did this transition come from someone who smashed back-to-back -back hundreds to getting selected for Australia as a first-choice off-spinner? Look, I think growing up, when I was a batter, 
I put so much time and effort into batting and my bowling was part time and slowly they sort of equaled out a little bit. And when you when you're a, say if you're an under 15s batter at the top of your game in under 15s and you're an okay bowler, sometimes they might look to blood you a little bit early and get you into the the older format. And then once I started playing, you know, you're batting eight. And I found it hard to get out of that mould of a number eight batter. Now, that was only because of my own mindset and, and not scoring runs and, and that type of thing. But for me, once I'd got into men's cricket, I really enjoyed the bowling aspects and batting came as a bonus. I probably didn't work on it hard enough. Once I started playing for Australia again, I started working my batting harder and harder and harder. And look, the results showed for me. It showed that I didn't work hard enough when I was growing up. Yeah. So you did have some impressive performances for Australia and uh, the one that comes to my mind are the three tests in the 2009 Ashes that you played and uh, you know then you were replaced for the last two tests. So did you feel a bit hard done by because the Australians later, later came out and said that it was a big mistake? Yeah, look, I understood the fourth test playing at Headingley, uh, a green wicket. Uh, Marcus North was there to play as well. So he could have done a job uh, and it made sense to play four quicks I think the fifth test definitely was a big mistake. Uh, I was injured and I was really struggling going into it. I believe that I would have made a difference uh, being a frontline spinner. You know, me and Marcus still spun the ball the same way, but it would have allowed, you know, I had played really well with those three tests leading up to it. It was just the way the selectors wanted to go. It was very disappointing at the end of the day, but I remember those tests very fondly. It was, you know, a challenge, you know, facing bowlers, bowling to the, the best in the world. But I do believe that fifth test, I, I would have made a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, you won the 2003 World Cup being a part of the squad. You won the Champions Trophy with Australia. But which is your most memorable spell for Australia, you know, be it in ODIs or in tests? I had a spell against South Africa in Joburg. Uh, Joburg's pretty tough place to bowl spin. I took two for, I think, two for not many, two for 30 maybe. Uh, Herschel Gibbs uh, and Albie Morkel, I got both of them out. It was probably probably the best I've bowled for, for Australia. I've had other bits and pieces. Champions Trophy final against New Zealand, I took three for 30 odd. Not the same sort of calibre batsman and the wickets were a little bit better, but Joburg against South Africa under lights when they were chasing. They were in a really good position and, and I... I felt I'd changed the, the course of the game with the way that I bowled. You know, I was never a huge turner of the ball, but I was someone that was uh, able to ch- do different things. And uh, if I was having to pick one spell out, that would be up there. Yeah. Uh, 17 tests, 63 wickets, 58 ODIs and 63 wickets again. Uh, yeah. Do you feel you would have, uh, you know, you should have got a longer rope, you know, now that you're retired and I hope that you can, you know, come out in the open and talk about it. Uh, do you feel that, you know, I understand during Shane Warne's period, it is not easy for anyone, but you no, know, there was yep. a period before Nathan Lyon that, you know, Australia really was struggling for a spinner. You tried Xavier Doherty and there were a few spinners. Even Steve Smith was playing as a uh, first choice spinner. So, uh, do you think that, you know, that was a wrong decision by the board and they should have backed you a bit more given that you bat also? Yeah, I do. Uh, in test cricket, especially. I wasn't. I had that really bad series against India in India leading up to the Ashes. That was my downfall. Wasn't bowling well enough. So the Australians wanted to go with somebody they could trust, which is completely understandable. I'd been picked in the World Cup to go in India and then I dislocated my shoulder. And that was that was the end of my career, really. Being an off-spinner and, you know, at the age of 30, it's really tough to, to get your, your shoulder right and back in, you know, bowling properly. I felt I had a lot more to give before they let me go, but it's just the, the nature of the business. You know, if you're not performing well enough and there are other people there, then you're not going to get a crack. Are you? you have to, you have to keep moving forward. Yeah. So the last test wicket was Cheteshwar Pujara, I believe. So any, yes. About that wicket? He, uh, the ball didn't spin. So he played down the line, you know, how he sometimes can play inside the line of the ball, uh, just hit off stump. Uh, there was, that was probably the, I think India needed 170 uh, in a day and a bit to, to win the test. And, you know, they just attacked, which you'd expect. Uh, Pajara, that was his very debut test. He played really well both innings. Yeah, look, it was a really tough time. We were so close to winning that series, that first test. We lost by one wicket. And then, you know, that second test, we were in winning positions both times, but we just didn't capitalise. I didn't bowl well enough. That was 
being the main spinner, I just didn't do a job and it made it too tough for the, the rest of our bowlers. So if you look back at your career, do you have any regrets or you know, how would you describe your career in a word if you wanted to? I think the regrets are that I, I didn't work smart enough on my bowling and work hard enough on my batting. Uh, I would have liked to have been fitter. I was consistently injured through little uh, muscle tears or little niggles or whatever it was. I wasn't fit enough to, to handle the rigours of test cricket. I, I felt that I would have been okay to do it, but back-to-back -back tests took it out of me. I think I let all the external noise uh, disrupt me. Uh, that's media, crowds, everyone, selectors. Instead of just focusing on me and, and harnessing that and putting it all in one thing, I was more worried about other stuff that could really affect me, which is why I've created my academy. I've created my own cricket app, you know, so that I can talk to kids all the time about, you know, the, the things that I go through. I send them stuff every day about cricket or article. Like I just make sure that, the best cricketer that they can be is the one that's focused on themselves and nothing else. Okay. It's very well summarized, sir. So talking about the Indian team, you know, they faced a comprehensive defeat uh, in the World Test Championship final. But one of the big victories that will always remain, you know, with them is the Gabba one, uh, the way they yep. uh, breached the fortress. So uh, anything about that, you know, the series, uh, I did see one of your interviews in which you said that, you know, the likes of Jadeja and everyone will be crucial. But nobody had seen this coming that, you know, there will be a third string Indian side that would beat Australia on their, you know, favourite hunting ground. So, anything about that you would like to say? I think it was a little bit too far. I think the Australians were tired uh, at the end. You know, the no rotation of quicks is, is really tough on those four, on the, on the three three quicks and, and gas. I felt that it's very hard to actually rotate such a, a predominant, a prolific pace attack. Mitchell Stark wasn't at his best. You know, Cummins and Hazelwood had bowled really well. Nathan Lyon wasn't as effective. He bowled a lot of overs. And it doesn't matter how many steps you come off, his fingers and everything are still tired. It doesn't take much to be, you know, he bowled, oh, I can't even remember how many overs, but he wasn't as effective. Look, I think Tim Payne's captaincy probably wasn't as great as what it had been. And that's easy for me because I'm not playing. I'm not in the heat of the moment. And I've always said that when you're out there, you miss things you don't mean to. You just, your brain's fried and... So all those things on our side were, were probably things that weren't as good. And then saying that India, you know, having to, to survive a draw, you know, tick for that straight away. Like that's a, that's a hugely mental battle one there. Uh, and then going to the Gabba and being able to chase that score down on the last day, you know, Pant played unbelievable in both. He played, you know, look, just superb. He played just fearless. Uh, you know, look, and then when he does that in England in that World Test Championship, everyone goes, why they attack so early? So it's it's one of those players that you go, look, you know what you're going to get with him. You have to accept that some days he's going to win a test, other days he's going to lose a test for you. And that's probably just his growth as a cricketer to, to keep going. And as a coach, you've probably got to make sure that you don't stifle his excitement and his naturalism. But at the same time, he's got to understand that sometimes you've got to find a way, you know, just find a way to just last that half an hour. But, you know, the way India played in that test was just amazing. Uh, you know, no Kohli, uh, Rahani probably wasn't at his best. You know, these sort of different bits and pieces, it it makes a, a really great script, to be honest. And I would love to see, you know, uh, when Australia go back over there, how it's going to be, what players are obviously going to be around, but it's, it'd be a great series again. So do you think Payne is still the right man to lead Australia into the Ashes? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do think he's the right man. Look, he's done an incredible job uh, when he came on board and what he had to endeavour and go through. And he's led that team outstandingly. Uh, I think the opportunity after the Ashes is probably for someone like maybe a Manus or, or someone coming through that they've pinpointed to, to lead the team. Uh, being a captain's not just about all the on-field stuff, it's everything external as well. There's, when you're part of that uh, external uh, environment, everything you've got to do, it's completely draining and zapping. You've got to remember Payne is a, a world-class keeper. You know, he's a, a very, very good batter and captain of, a, you know, one of the best sides we've had for a while. And it just, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So I, I think he'd be, I think, I don't think, I don't see Australia making some sort of move before the Ashes. So, you know, talking about the Ashes, uh, England kind of are, you know, 
there are talks that england are taking other teams too lightly you know and everything that goes wrong for them they just say we are just preparing for the ashes you know it's this ashes to ashes cycle that you know australia doesn't do this australia gives every team you know equal importance and these are just reports you know these are not my thoughts but uh, the way new zealand beat them you know uh, and you do you feel that this is india's best chance of beating them or do you feel the way indian batting capitulated in the world test championship final so there are some issues there also i think india you know history has shown a swinging ball uh, in england they don't play incredibly well and that's australia i guess the swinging ball in england don't play incredibly well i don't think the england bowlers were at their best either broad and anderson that they are getting tired i think it's going to be a good series for England to be only focused on the Ashes is, in my view, the wrong point of view. You've got to win every test that you play for your country. And I understand the long-term, you know, long-term jeopardy of some of the players like Broad and Anderson looking after them, you know, maybe trying to rotate a batter in and out every now and again. But the, the reality is their batters aren't scoring mountains of runs that you can afford to bring somebody in. On the other side of the, the spectrum is India, who didn't play well against New Zealand at all. Uh, they didn't. That New Zealand bowling attack is the best in the world. There is no doubt about that bowling attack. Uh, there's a lot said of the side that India took in. Uh, Shane Warne was saying that New Zealand should have taken a spinner. At the end of the day, you've got to take in your best 11 to win in those conditions. If India thought it's two spinners, then they do that, and then they have to wear that, that they have, that it wasn't the right side. You know, Siraj, when he played out here in Australia, was outstanding. He, you know, look, he, he led that attack being such a young kid. I, I think some, I think it, there's a lot to be said for uh, cricketers or athletes that have no uh, skeletons in the closet. So for these players who have never played in England or, or never batted in those conditions, you know, Pant, he might come out now. He's had one crack. He can understand what it's like and the quick bowlers. Oh, I think I think England need to make a statement, to be honest. If they come out and get rolled over again, then they're, they're just going to be keep getting hounded by their media. And eventually those, you know, that mental demon inside you, it starts to just get a bit bigger. They've got to be got to be switched on in their own home soil and, and provide a better fight. Uh, Joe Root, as a captain, uh, he has lost two Ashes series, you know, and s- someone needs to be incredibly lucky as an England captain to survive two Ashes defeats. So, do you think this this series that is coming against Australia or against India, you know, this could be up on his captaincy also if he loses? Yeah, it's, it is. Look, it's a really important thing. It's one of those when you lose a test, the captain's in charge. When you win a test, the teams come up, come together. It's always the captain's decisions that are in the spotlight. What, no matter what it is, uh, what win, lose or draw, but they're under more scrutiny when you lose. It's very hard to comment. I don't see all of the in- England tests, but I have seen the Ashes tests and there are different tactics that you try and wonder what he's thinking, what he's doing. I think personally, he's got to play a game or just sort of throwing caution to the wind. Could be his last ever Ashes series. His players, you know, his batting order, he's going to have Butler and Stokes bat. So those two guys are going to provide amazing depth there himself, three. Now he just needs to work around those three batters have really got to take on the core responsibility like England did many years ago when you had Strauss, Cook, Trot, Peterson. Those four took it upon themselves to to win the Ashes themselves. So if they can do that, they'll, they'll be putting their best foot forward. Yeah. And you said about Siraj, you know, and India played, uh, made a wrong move by playing two spinners. So, or whom do you think Siraj should replace? You know, Ashwin or Jadeja. You are a spinner, like you know, you know very well how to bowl in English conditions. So, whom would you replace for Siraj, or someone like a Shardul Thakur? Yeah, look, I think personally, it is a really tough one. So you don't need the two spinners because. They've got to be providing, if they're batting at, you know, seven and eight, they've got to be really averaging. Like, Jadeja's got a better batting average than Ashwin. Ashwin's a better bowler. I think the way that Ashwin bowls with that new juke ball, being able to bowl his little seamers as well, Jadeja's a lock, just a lock-in bowler. He'll, he'll do a job for you very consistently, and you know what you're going to get. I think what they've got to do is make a decision and go, okay, these are the bowlers that, or these are the batters we're going to come against. 
who's going to provide the, the most potent attack against these. Uh, if it's Shadeja, it's Shadeja. Ashwin, it's Ashwin. I, I think what you'd have to, to decide would be, for me personally, would be Ashwin would play. And that's only because Ashwin provides a little bit of difference. And when that ball and the wickets are new, he gets that more bounce, whereas Jadej is just bang, 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 bang. On a wearing wicket, he's just as tough. I think Ashwin offers a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, if I put you on a spot, you know, that give uh, give us a prediction of the test series, you know, who, what if, what would be your score line? Look, I think it's going to be close. I don't think it's going to be, you know, in the past, probably would have said England and would outplay India. I think Virat's been not scoring runs for too long, to be honest. He's he's the best in the world, or one of, you know, not if not the best, the second best at the moment. He's just not in form. I feel like he's going to come into his own. Joe Root, I think I think it's going to be one with both bowling attacks, whoever can bowl the best. I, I'm not, I reckon, I'm going to say a drawn series. There you go. Uh, it's a really hard call. I just, maybe the, the weather might play a part a little bit as well, but I just, the two teams, I can't split them at the moment. I just feel that that Indian batting lineup, yes, they've been not batting well, but world-class players, eventually they, they come round and Virat can't keep missing out. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for your time and thank you for giving your insights. It was really inspiring to hear your story and the way you made a comeback uh thanks a lot once again and i'm hoping to connect with you in the future no worries mate thank you very much and, and hello to everyone and stay safe over there we're in lockdown here in brisbane tonight so uh it's been a pleasure talking and, and maybe we get to chatting more throughout the series thank you thank you so much